With redundancies sadly now an everyday feature of business life, I'm taking a two-part look at the selection process. In this video, I focus on redundancy pools. In this video, I look at redundancy selection criteria. A redundancy pool refers to the group of employees who are at risk of redundancy and from which an employer will select the individuals to dismiss. Deciding who should be in the pool is something employers often struggle with. Sometimes it's simple. If a small business is shutting its only site, the redundancy pool will be all its employees. But often the situation is more nuanced. An employer must balance the commercial advantages of keeping the pool small, less employee disruption and less work for the employer, against the potential for backlash from those who are eventually made redundant from a pool they say was too small and was designed to target them or wasn't a reasonable choice of pool for an employer to make. A redundancy situation arises where an employer needs fewer employees to do work of a particular kind. It includes a workplace closure where the work stops completely or a reduction in headcount. For example, where a business reduces the number of customer service representatives from 10 to 6. If an employee has been employed for more than two years, they've got the right not to be unfairly dismissed. And for a redundancy dismissal to be fair, the normal unfair dismissal test will apply. Number one, the employer has to have a fair reason to dismiss. Redundancy has to be the real reason for dismissal. And number two, the employer has to act reasonably in relation to the dismissal. This means following a fair procedure and the decision to dismiss must be within the range of reasonable responses open to the employer in the circumstances. A fair procedure in redundancy cases includes a reasonable consultation process, identifying a reasonable pool of employees, that's what this video is about, Applying fair selection criteria to those employees, that's what the second video I'm recording is about, link below, and considering any suitable alternative employment. The decision about who goes in the redundancy pool is a matter for the employer. Their choice of pool needs to be within the range of reasonable conduct which a reasonable employer could have adopted. It's a pretty relaxed test. Tribunals will usually say that there might be several reasonable pools an employer could choose. And for the pool to be fair, all you as an employer have to show is that they've gone through a reasonable thought process and arrived at a reasonable business decision. It's a commercial decision which tribunals are reluctant to get involved in unless, say, the pool is discriminatory. For example, it includes only female workers or unreasonable in some other way. For example, it includes only employees a manager dislikes. When deciding who to include in the pool, the first thing to think about is whether there are any rules about redundancy pools contained in a workplace or collective trade union agreement. If so, it goes without saying you have to follow those agreed procedures. But if not, should you go for a large pool with lots of employees or, or a small pool with very few? Employers and employees rarely agree over this, but as long as your decision as the employer is reasonable, it won't be criticised by a tribunal. Employees usually want as large a pool as possible because it reduces the likelihood of any particular individual being selected for redundancy, and it usually gives more ground for challenge by saying you should have picked him or her, but not me. Conversely, employers generally prefer to keep the pool as small as possible. The fewer employees included in the redundancy process, the less disruption there is in the workplace, the less impact on staff morale, and the smaller the chance of a successful challenge to scores later down the road. But there are downsides also to too large a redundancy selection pool. You risk the best employees, the very ones you want to retain, panicking, looking elsewhere, and being snapped up by a competitor. The larger the pool, the more managers will need to be involved in the scoring process and that can increase the risk of inconsistency. Now all those risk factors can be managed but if the pool is unnecessarily large, perhaps because you as an employer are being too cautious, then things may be slightly more difficult in the long run. Fortune favours the brave here. Let's think about identifying the pool. The starting position is a simple one, 
What are you trying to achieve? Remember, the definition of redundancy is important here. What kind of work or stopping is stopping or reducing? It might be that a business is trying to reduce headcount in a geographical area like Manchester or in a particular area of work such as warehouse operatives. And once you've worked that out, the next step is to see whether any other employees beyond those in Manchester or those working in the warehouse need to be included in the pool as well. In a moment, I'm going to look at the different positions for role-based and geography-based redundancies. And if you're an employer thinking about making redundancies, please have a look at gettingredundancyright.com, link below. It's my personal 10-part course on making redundancies, and as well as access to 10 video modules where I explain step by step how to carry out a redundancy process and avoid all the common pitfalls, you also get a redundancy selection matrix that I prepared, a copy of the actual template redundancy policy that I use with my SME clients, access to an online forum I set up to answer questions on redundancy issues, transcripts of the 10 video modules, template redundancy letters to send to your workforce, and more. Full details at www.gettingredundancyright.com and there's a load of free resources on that website for you. Back to selecting your redundancy pool. Let's look first at role-based redundancies. For role-based redundancies, our warehouse operatives, for example, it's important to look at what employees actually do when considering the redundancy pool. This means looking at contracts of employment, but also looking at what happens on the ground. Let's say you need to reduce headcount in the packing department of your warehouse, for example. Your packers would go in the pool. But what about other workers in the warehouse, such as pickers, who do similar work and have interchangeable skills? Well, there's some case law that suggests they should go in the pool too, because the skills are interchangeable. This is something I explain in detail in Module 4 of gettingredundancyright.com. The less skilled the work, the more likely it is that skills between roles will be regarded by a tribunal as interchangeable, and the failure to have that wider pool might make a dismissal unfair. Although warehouse roles might involve very similar skills, the same may not apply to other roles. You wouldn't necessarily lump your engineers in one pool because mechanical engineers do a very different job from civil or electrical engineers. The situation's more complex when employees only spend some of their time in that area, in the area that's subject to cuts. So in a case called Hendy Bank City Print and Fairbrother, a case uh, I did about 15 years ago now, a printing company was outsourcing its work in its finishing department relating to a particular type of machine. The employer chose a small redundancy pool containing only the employees who worked on those machines. The Employment Appeal Tribunal agreed with the employees that the pool was too small. The employees in the pool only spent a third of their time on that particular machine. The rest of the time they were doing the same work as the other employees who weren't in the pool. The employees in the finishing department had interchangeable skills and all of them should have been in the pool. So when deciding who should go in the pool, employers should ask the following questions. What roles are being cut? Can the people working in those roles on a particular machine or in a particular area also do the jobs in the other area or department? Have they done that kind of work before? Are the skills between workers interchangeable? And if the answer is yes to one or more of the last three questions, Think about expanding your pool to include all the workers, all the employees with interchangeable work or skills. This might make more work for you, but it's not all bad. The plus side is you get to keep the very best employees who are doing that kind of work. What about site or geographical based redundancies? If you have offices in Manchester and London and are closing the Manchester office, it's going to be reasonable to include only the Manchester employees in the redundancy pool. But what if the offices are geographically closer? Does an employer have to spread the net more widely? If the two sites are close together and the skills between workers are interchangeable, for example, two shops employing retail workers, then it might be fair to include all employees in the same pool. If the sites are only a few miles apart and staff can access either site easily, the issue is straightforward. Again, this is something I cover in detail in Module 4 of gettingredundancyright.com. But what sort of distances are we looking at? How, how far is too far? In a case called Highland Fish Farmers Against Thorburn, an employer needed to make eight redundancies from a workforce of 50. One office was making a loss, so the employer shut that office and made all three employees there redundant. 
Now, two of the three had previously worked at another site 40 minutes away, and they said they wanted to keep their jobs and work at that 40 minutes away site instead. The Employment Appeal Tribunal noted the sites were geographically close and they worked collaboratively together. And they said it wasn't reasonable to limit the pool to the site that had closed. And accordingly, the dismissals for redundancy were unfair. Now, this won't always be the case for offices which are 40 minutes apart. In fact, I think it's quite a surprising decision. A close working relationship between the two sites was clearly relevant here, as was the fact the employees had worked at both sites. But it does show care must be taken. Make sure you think about whether you need to cast the net wider. Having a pool of one or any pool where the number of employees in it matches the number of redundancies exactly can be very attractive to you as an employer. It significantly limits workplace disruption and the work involved in a redundancy process. But this kind of pull can attract allegations of bias because it can feel like an individual rather than a role is being targeted. Sometimes it will be reasonable to limit the pull. Standalone roles are a prime example. It was reasonable to have a pool of one for an employee who was posted to China when a UK-based business decided to outsource their Chinese work. That's a case called Halpin and Sandpiper Books. But pools of one aren't limited to standalone roles, though. In Alvis, Vickers and Lloyd, another case, a pool of one was fair in relation to an export manager who covered one geographical area, even though there were eight other export managers who could theoretically have gone in the pool. The work had reduced in Mr Lloyd's area, and the company wanted to keep the others where they had strong client relationships. But tribunals can come to different conclusions in different cases, and I'll explain how to deal with that in a moment. So, for example, in Bayard and Capita Hartshead, another case, the employee was one of four actuaries. The employer lost some of her clients, they tried and failed to obtain new work for her, and they made her redundant from a pool of one. They said that actuaries were personally appointed to particular pension funds, and it was the employee's clients who had gone, therefore pool of one. The employer said there was a risk of losing its other client if actuaries were moved between funds, and said team morale would be affected if other actuaries were included when they hadn't lost any work. The Employment Appeal Tribunal disagreed. It said the actuaries did similar work, Miss Bayard's work had been praised, and the risk of capita losing business was slight. The pool of one was therefore unfair. What's the difference in all these cases, I hear you ask? Well, the facts in two employment tribunal cases are never identical, and that can throw up different results. But in Lloyd, the first case we looked at, the employer had thought carefully about the pool and given facts which supported its decision to exclude other workers from it. Clearly in Bayard, the second case, the actuaries, the employer's evidence on the same issue didn't stand up to scrutiny. Now, there's a clear lesson here. If you're going to use a pool of one, do your homework and make sure your reasoning and the evidence for it is sound. Here are my four top tips for choosing the redundancy selection pool. Number one, establish your primary pool. Where are you cutting jobs? A geographical location or a type of work or a type of role? Number two, once you've established your primary pool, consider whether other employees should be included due to close geography or interchangeable work and skills. Number three, be prepared to discuss and defend your chosen pool as part of the redundancy consultation process. Be open to varying your pool if discussions show it's reasonable to do so. If you recognise a trade union, try to agree the pool with the trade union representatives. And number four, most importantly, document your thought processes and decision making contemporaneously. If you consider and discount a wider pool, keep a record of your reasoning. Keep all internal emails and correspondence on the issue. A clear record of your reasoning can often be the holy grail in any tribunal proceedings. Thank you for watching this video. Please do like it. There's a load of free resources for redundancy, which I've made available to you at gettingredundancyright.com. Also, here's another video on redundancy issues, and this is a video I think you might like. I'm Barrister Daniel Barnett. Thank you.